welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters, well, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pineker. Um, Josh, welcome back to the program. Josh Gailey of the Church of Jesus Christ, welcome back. Thanks for having me on. Good to be back. Just a reminder, folks, Josh is the uh, event and evangelist of the Church of Jesus Christ based in Monagahill, Pennsylvania. I would heartily recommend Daniel P. Stone's book, William Bickerton, Forgotten Latter-day Prophet. I did a book review of this as well as an interview with the author. Um, if you want to know more about the history of the church, especially its founding prophet or reorganized uh, prophet who reorganized the church, um, we're here to talk about Josh's book, Witnessing Miracles, Historical Evidence for the Resurrection and the Book of Mormon. Uh, you got your copy there. Mine's a hardcover. Yours is a paperback, so we'll see where I write. And then um, I also want to remind people. Well, rate high, higher than me. <laughs> so I also want to let people know that uh, this is one of my favorite editions of the Book of Mormon. Uh, you guys use the same versification as the Utah branch. Uh, I like it because it's a very clean uh, text, uh, much larger text and words of Christ in red. You are uh, a red letter Christian church, which I think we could use a lot more of that type kind of Christian these days. Amen. Amen, brother. And uh, so basically, um, I just wanted to talk to you. Uh, first of all, this was a book, Witnessing Miracles, that was long overdue to be written. I think that it's a very well put together book. I, I finished reading it this morning. I think what Josh does is just takes the uh, apologetic arguments that me, many evangelical scholars, including Mike Lacona, Gary Harbormouse, and William Lane Craig, um, have been using to defend the coming forth of, of actually the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jo Josh just takes it one step further, saying you can use these exact same arguments about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And I think you make a very compelling case. So this is going to be an interesting interview. Uh, just a few things. The merch store is open, mormonbookreviews.com. Got a nice new shirt with a big logo on there. Um, got, uh, we got the, you know, we got a ton of stuff. Okay, phone case covers, uh, you, know, you name it. Uh, and uh, coasters, buttons, whatever. Uh, check out the store if you want to support us financially on both PayPal and um, Patreon. Uh, I do appreciate those who are supporting us financially. I'll leave links in the description. So if you want to help us out, it's greatly appreciated. Uh Josh, uh, this is, uh, I think, your third time on the program, and uh, I've really enjoyed my time fellowshipping with members of the Church of Jesus Christ. I've attended services in two separate congregations based here in Florida. Um, I feel very much at home with you people, uh, and I love you, and I really appreciate you, and uh, I just had to say that because I just, I, I think so highly of you and your, your organization. Um, the love well, is the love is reciprocated. And I think one of my favorite things that's come out of all of this, Stephen, is our friendship, which is genuine and uh, count you as a dear friend. And that's great. This stuff is ancillary to that. And I'm blessed. So, uh, Amen. Well, of course, and you got somebody that can pick you up at the airport every time you fly out here, too. So that's cool. that doesn't hurt. That doesn't hurt. <laughs> so um, before we get actually into the uh, book itself, I actually want to kind of have a conversation because this is a book review channel, and I think there's a lot of people who are authors or aspiring authors. I kind of want you to kind of give us the background on one, what made you decide to write the book? Um, what is the process of writing the book? What is the process of getting a book published? And what made you, and what was the decision to go with the publisher that you did? So maybe just kind of detail that for the audience for us today. Yeah. So anybody that wants to write a book, a couple of things I've learned. Number one, you need a very patient wife. And I have one. And I'm very grateful for my wife. She's been super supportive. There have been countless hours. And by the way, if you time the baby right, your your wife will go to bed early with the baby. And then you have a few hours to write in the evening. So that happened for us. So God was in the matter each step of the way with our little Phoebe Lou. And, um, you know, it's probably easier than ever to write a book. What, what you're saying reminds me how different it is today than it was for Joseph Smith to write the Book of Mormon. I mean, it, I, it's, it's incredible. The what most people I, I watched uh, Jonathan Neville. You may have a different interpretation, but what most people would say and argue for about a 65 day translation process and production process for the original manuscript with quill pen and paper and here i'm on google docs writing i have you know spell check i have the advantage of every modern technology my google doc saves automatically as i go right if the computer shuts down i i haven't lost much at all so it's never been probably easier to write a book not that writing a book is easy 
but it's never been easier. So just a few thousand hours of study and a few thousand hours of production, and you can have a book. So, <laughs> um, but it's a, it honestly, halfway through the process, I was rereading my Book of Mormon and I was still in awe of this text that got produced that needs an answer, whether it's a naturalistic answer or a spiritual answer of how it came into existence. So my book is an attempt to look at the miracle of its production. And like you said, what we're doing basically is we have scholars that are out there that have purported the miracle of the resurrection. For me, what they've done, what Michael Lacona, what William Lane Craig, what Gary Habermas have done, is they've created a hypothesis. They've created a model of how to historically test a miracle from history, how to take a miracle and examine if it could be historically tested. Here's the metric. Here's the model. And I said, great. I can do an al algebraic equation. I can do this. I can plug this in. And so I used the exact same model and applied it to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Production-wise, uh, publication-wise, I'll be honest, our church looked at it and said, hey, we want to support this. So the, the church, actually the apostles approved it, and it is a publication. Um, I'm very honored for this. It's not something I, I sought after, but it's a blessing to me. The church is behind me in the publication. It's published by the Church of Jesus Christ. We chose to do it then when we were looking at the best ways to print. We chose to do it through some of Amazon's services because it's so easy today. And frankly, I've caught two errors and updated it even just last week. Somebody wrote to me, Josh, love the book. Do you want to hear an error or not? And I, I wrote him back. I said, I don't want to, but I need to. So yeah, please send it. And they did. And you know, anybody that orders one tomorrow, it'll have those updates. So that's super easy. So the power of a big company behind you in the printing is is that that the some of those quote unquote print on demand services and being able to have access to Kindle and we're going to put it out on Audible when I actually take some time to read through the book. Uh, it's just amazing. So printing has never been easier, even though, I mean, technology is so, so it's probably never been easier to write and print a book. It's been fun to be through it each step of the way and kind of be working alongside it. The church let me have that control each step. They never, never really stepped in or tried to interfere. They, all I had was support and I'm very grateful. I, I'm not sure I deserve that support, but I'm, I'm thankful to have it. So earlier this week, I actually uh, did a Robert Messick, Messick from Book of Mormon Editions, uh, co-hosted a program where we, Richard, uh, we interviewed Richard Saunders, who did a book on the 1820 edition, 1920, excuse me, edition of the Book of Mormon, which was printed in my backyard, um, where I come from. Uh, it, there's actually a very revealing story that will be revealed on that episode uh, about my connection to that actual publication, which is pretty weird. Um, but they had, there was an error in that edition where cannot or kunat or something cannot was misspelled and it wasn't corrected until 1827 so that gives you the idea of how far we've come that's remarkable remarkable i i can't imagine the 1830 edition the 1837 edition just what they had to go through just to get a text out there and if you've ever been to new york you have to go to the museum grandland's um, museum of the print shop is incredible. The ink splatter is still on the walls there. It's so fun to see as far as Book of Mormon production goes. It really, you know, the Book of Mormon was twice the size of the average book from the time period hmm. and produced in such a short time. And even something small like this, okay, the, the Erie Canal opens up in what, 1823 or 1825, I think 1825. And then printing technology, most books before the War of 1812, they're printed in England, okay? So really, between 1812 and 1830, a explosion of technology happens. I think Professor Keith Wilson at BYU has an awesome presentation he does on that, but there's an explosion of technology. Erie Canal opens up, uh, opens up the waterways for technology to ship west from New York City, and then basically the same year the Book of Mormon is being sought after for a printer, Granlin has access to this brand new printing press 
that is state-of-the-art technology that allowed them to even print the Book of Mormon. For a believer, you can see God's timing in it each step of the way and how the door opened for this new text to come forth by the gift and power of God. It is exactly a Christian apologetic that a lot of Christians use in favor of the time, life and time of Jesus's ministry. It was timed right at the precise moment that the Roman Empire was at its peak and that one could travel easily in the known world at the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, the and and so for for both books, just to keep stringing together these parallels, because they're all over the place here, you know, there's a 400 year prophetic gap between Old Testament and New Testament, right? I mean, really, after the the Babylonian conquest, not much is there. There's this empty time frame. And uh, Josephus writes about it. It's even in some of the, the Jewish writings and, and even in 1 Maccabees, okay, which is scripture for some, not scripture for others. But in that apocryphal book, it even talks about there has not been a true succession of, of prophets since the time of Persia. Okay, so there is this gap that's even admitted to by the Jews of prophetic writings and authoritative writings. And then Jesus Christ comes comes out of the tomb, and unapologetically, the apostles are preaching and writing, and they acknowledge their writings as Scripture. Second Peter 3.16, Peter acknowledges the writings of Paul as authoritative Scripture. Paul writes his own letters and gives them equal authority, he calls them the Word of God within his own writings. That's a bold claim. That's a claim of, of an authoritative voice. And the Book of Mormon does the same thing. It comes after this long prophetic gap, okay, that had taken place in time where literally the church, because of Gnostic writings that had flooded in and other challenges, well, what's the word of God? What's not the word of God? It makes sense the church made a canon, okay? I understand why, but when they did, the church evolved while the Bible remained sealed okay it, it remained closed it was it was finished it was a completed product the book of mormon comes forth just like the new testament scriptures and unapologetically proclaims an authoritative voice of god again it's something we have to reconcile as we address the book and its pages and there is a parallel there a gap in time a seemingly closed set of scriptures in the hebrew bible and then boom new testament coming forth same process here with the Book of Mormon. It's at least interesting. It is fascinating. And actually, one of the things I really liked is you quoted a poem uh, that Paul quotes, which is kind of like a statement of faith that he was quoting other Christians giving at the time with a high Christology. So we could see already that scripture was, uh, you know, it was, was being produced even before Paul was writing scripture. Yeah, it's it. You can funnel it down, and this is what is amazing with that from the New Testament side. Okay, you know, Mark might be the earliest gospel written maybe 25 years after the activating event, after the crucifixion and resurrection. Roughly 25 years later, you have Mark. Well, Mark records within his writings, he records the crucifixion, but we know he didn't see it. So with that, Mark funnels us close, and there's some scholars that say he brings us to within seven years of the empty tomb and the crucifixion events within his account. Okay, really, really more the within his account, it's really more the crucifixion. And then to your point, multiple times for Paul, he seems to be quoting early church traditions or statements of faith or creeds, whatever you want to call them. First Corinthians 15 is one. There's one in Philippians that I just think is just so incredible. And he quotes them. And what it's doing is it's bringing this Christology of the time, okay, this view of Christ from the, that era. And because Paul's quoting these early church beliefs, these early church, maybe things that would have been repeated, learned, shared within the earliest, probably many of them illiterate Christians to the Christian faith, it brings us to within two, three years of the empty tomb when these things would have been consolidated and taught in that way to unify the faith that was now spreading like crazy, even within two to three years, even around Jerusalem and outside. 
think it's important that the audience recognize that Josh has a very, very high view of scripture and that he has the same view of scripture that the very apologists that he uses their framework for making his defense of the Book of Mormon. So I want evangelicals, people who believe in the Bible, to listen carefully what Josh is saying. Uh, he believes in the same scriptures that you believe. He believes in the same New Testament, and he believes in the same Jesus you believe in. And uh, he also believes in the Book of Mormon. But you make the case. And I think, like I had told you off camera, the Book of Mormon, evidence that demands a verdict. And I think that's yeah. what you have wrote for us. Uh, tell me what was it that when you are engaging the Christian evangelical apologists who are defending the, uh, the resurrection, okay, um, also, I think it was good you quoted Bart Ehrman, you quoted atheists who also acknowledged that there was indeed a Christ. That is a historical account, no question. It's an established fact. And, uh, but also, uh, the, the arguments that you make and the Christian apologists make is that uh, there's a very strong argument that m- makes it very clear that Jesus Christ was crucified, but he also rose from the grave. Tell us how you use some of their tools to uh, to establish the, your argument. Well, and, and just to start, Stephen, I would say this is for somebody that is like, well, why even do this for the Book of Mormon? Which if you're coming from a background that has never even attempted to look at the Book of Mormon before, I get that. So let me make a quick pitch for that, is that if the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, if it is Scripture, if it is a revealed text, then it is the strongest evidence for the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ ever offered to mankind. Now, you may, you if you accept the premise, it's worth at least looking for that, because within the Book of Mormon, after Christ's ascension, he descends to the Temple Bountiful and appears before 2,500 people, and now we have a cross-continental independent attestation of the risen Lord. So with that, it the potential is now obviously the Book of Mormon can be fraudulent and it doesn't hurt the evidence for the resurrection. That can stand on its own. But if you can at least peek through the door a little bit and be open to a crack, a sliver of a crack of, well, if, if this is, it has the potential to be the greatest evidence for Jesus Christ ever given. And it's given in our day and time. That's incredible. So to me, that's my argument to say, it's worth looking at. It's worth pursuing. And to your question then of whether or not, you know- uh, One thing I just want to say- Yeah, jump in. I think it's also important to recognize the fact that the Book of Mormon has a very high view of the Bible. And it actually would solve a lot of problems if proven to be true- it would actually solve the Isaiah problem. It would solve a lot of issues that the 19th century German school have brought up about the, the, the Bible. It actually kind of solves a lot of those problems and gives a stronger uh, uh, witness to the Bible. I, I can dive down this road. I, I know we probably don't want to go down too far, but <laughs> you know, if you read the Book of Mormon, you read about scribes that are writing and abridging. And over time, you have Mormon and Moroni at the end of the text summarizing and abridging sections and portions. And so when we hear some of the later uh, textual criticism for the Bible, it's not very intimidating to me to think that scribes over time might review a text, might edit into a text. I see that happening in the Book of Mormon very openly. The fact that it could happen in a much more closed way within the Bible isn't that scary of a thought. I think it's a fun thing to pursue, at least from my mind, because I'm not uh, well, I'll just say it, I'm open to it because when I read the Book of Mormon, it tells me a story of that happening. So I'll continue. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to divert you there, but continue with where we were going previously. No, no it's good. So your question, let me make sure I, I mm-hmm. gather it so I can respond right. It's just, you know, when I first started looking at this, right, and mm-hmm. just seeing some of the parallels and, and going from there. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when I started doing this research, I've always, I have a, a degree in archaeological science. I was, um, uh, it comes from a secular university. So I was presented with a lot of, you know, atheist professors that don't believe in God and were, were teaching. And by the way, I, I loved my time there. It was so 
eye-opening and healthy for me spiritually even. But I began to pursue the evidence for Christ and wanted to understand that. So I began to read all kinds of things from, from the scholars we've mentioned. And I have, you know, a quarter of this bookshelf behind me is stuff all about the Bible and archaeology and different things. I just love that stuff. I just, I can be there all day. But the most important thing for me is understanding the historicity of the resurrection, is understanding of, is there any evidence for Jesus Christ to come out of the tomb? Because frankly, we could debate Genesis all day long and have different views and different interpretations. But if we unify around the fact that there was an empty tomb, that Christ came forth, then that is life-changing to us. So that that's the gospel. That's the message. He's risen. He's alive. Praise the Lord. And so I began to pursue this evidence. And there's some, it you can break it down on an interview like this, not that there aren't more com complexities within it, you can break it down fairly simply, especially like the empty tomb. Okay, there's three pieces to the empty tomb that are proffered by scholars, especially William Lane Craig on this one is really his, really within a lot of his works. And it's proximity to the tomb, enemies, and the testimonies of the women, which really I categorize as, as unlikely testimonies, testimonies you wouldn't culturally expect. So when you look at proximity, the tomb, the burial by Joseph of Arimathea, very historically uh, sound because a Christian group in the early days probably wouldn't have suggested that a sympathetic Jewish Sanhedrin was burying the Lord because that's who just put him to death. So there's a lot of good historical reasons to consider. Yeah, that sounds pretty authentic because it's not what they would have said. So when we look at history, just to give a couple bullet points as a background. This is the work of Behan McCullough and other historians that aren't writing on the resurrection, but have laid some ground rules. Okay, well, how do you tell when something's true, something's not true? How do you determine what took place? We can't go back there today, right? We can't go back and, and witness for ourselves. We don't have a camera on the, on the tomb on Sunday morning to record. So how do we determine whether or not something's plausible? Well, you can look at things like multiple attestation, okay? When you have independent people separate from each other sharing their version of the story, that makes it authentic. Or the earlier the source is, the better, right? The earlier you can get to your source documents, the better. Um, eyewitness testimony, very high. On an, that eliminates the rumor factor, right? The, the telephone game of going down and all of a sudden eight person, I heard such and such, and it's not even close to what happened. If you have eyewitness testimony, and what, what I'm hearing about, you may think, oh, that sounds like a courtroom case. Yeah, exactly. Examining history is kind of like a courtroom case, okay? And even when you have, what's neat is like, you could have two eyewitnesses that disagree, okay? Phoebe is a little young yet, but Josiah is old enough to defend himself. Eventually, my kids are going to get a little bit older, and, and someday, heaven forbid, there's going to be a scuffle, okay? And the debate is going to be who started it. But I, as a parent, am going to know, even though my kids disagree with what happened, okay, and may this never take place, <laughs> but, but even though I, they may disagree about who started it or what actually happened... I'm going to be able to look at it and go, well, I know the kids fought. Even if their eyewitness testimonies disagree, I can get to the core of the matter of what happened. That's what's cool with eyewitness testimony and some of these other things. I, I know the kids fought. There's no disputing that, even if they disagree in part. Embarrassing admissions, you know, and this all pulls on human tendencies, right? We rarely admit embarrassing things about ourselves unless it's true. Okay, let's look at, so we have proximity to the empty tomb. Uh, Jesus is buried just outside of Jerusalem. And we have even in Matthew 28, you have enemies to the church, the Sanhedrin, and the report that's floating around. And there's even a, a document that I don't think is very strong by Justin Martyr, but it, it's, it's there, it's out there, that even he even kind of says, well, this rumor is still floating around today that the enemies stole the body, okay? So, or that the, the Christians stole the body and the enemies 
to the Christian movement, the Jewish Sanhedrin were saying, well, the body's stolen. Well, that is interesting because that admits an empty tomb. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even the counter explanations that we have are admitting the empty tomb. And like unlikely testimonies, the testimonies of, of women, we have to go back culturally to the day and time. And when we do, it's a different world. Women aren't voting back then. Women have very little legal rights. They're really a, a property item with dowries and 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 it's it's concepts beyond you know our world today mm -hmm. but it, it's what happened then and josephus writes about it the talmud writes about it and they say things like you know and i always say this like hold the tomatoes ladies when i like teach this lesson or i'm you know it's like the the women might as well be as as equal to a robber right. in believability yeah. you know and harsh well, and words paul only quotes males in his letters yeah, and even the early, here we have in the Gospels, right? The Gospels record that the women were the first at the tomb. But the early Christian kind of creedal statement, that 1 Corinthians 15, uh, ignores the, the women aren't, they're absent. So within that two-year period of that being created, you can see them when wanting to proselytize the religion and avoiding the women completely, because culturally that would have been uh, actually in that day, it would have been very unbelievable for a woman to have been the the first to the tomb. That makes it very today historically authentic. Okay, it's an embarrassing admission by the early church within the Gospels. You know, so. and I think what's also interesting, and, and we're, we're spending a lot of time talking about the resurrection, but I think it's important that we establish this. Another thing that I think is in favor of the argument of the resurrection is that so many critics of the story say, no, Jesus wouldn't have had a, a grave. He would have been thrown in a common mass grave. And, uh, and, 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 and of course, Christians are going to avoid that part because that's an embarrassing thing. But this is the thing people don't understand. The crucifixion is a highly embarrassing thing. He's naked yeah. on a cross and suffering. Um, being thrown in a mass grave is a, a, is a mercy compared to what the crucifixion event was. So the fact that, and so even the story, if the Christians would have easily engaged a Christ that rose out of a mass grave as well. But the key yeah, thing true. was, is, is that it, it, the story seems to ring true because of Joseph Arimathea, the fact that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. These are, these are important details. And let's just put it this way, folks, you know, um, they say, well, Jesus would have been thrown. Well, Jesus was somebody that had, there were supporters of his, somebody who sits in the Sanhedrin could definitely go and work his connections and make sure his body's not thrown. This to me is all very plausible. Yeah. Well, and and so, um, you know, the mass grave thing, it, it, to your point, yeah, it's almost irrelevant. If he rose, he rose, that's glory. And, you know, when it comes to the crucifixion, there's probably very few, if, well, as far as historical events from antiquity, from way back then, there's very few, if any, events that are as historically attested. You have uh, Lucian, writing about it. You have uh, Tacitus, you have uh, Marabar Serapion. These are non-believers. So when you talk about multiple independent attestation, okay, you have early, for antiquity, very early documents from non-believing sources that we can, uh, just from the unbelieving sources, and this is in the book, you can understand that uh, Jesus was uh, preaching. He was doing works of, of, he was supposedly doing works of miracles. He's condemned to death by Pontius Pilate. He's crucified. And that the Christians claim that he, they were even worshiping him in that day. All of those facts can come from unbelievers from the time period, let alone the gospel accounts. So you have really for, for something that from that long ago, there's incredible good historical evidence for the crucifixion. In fact, there's some historians that write some pretty bold things, like it's as well attested as anything from antiquity. And this is the thing, and I think this is why we're, where we do the transition. We go from an empty tomb to an empty box. Yeah. And we also talk about the strength of witnesses. I want you to talk about that. Yeah, it's, well, just looking at source documents, okay, as we transition, Imagine, and you and I have talked about this on the sidelines, Stephen, so I think this is apropos here. Imagine, and I cite you in the book for this conversation, 
I don't know oh, if you saw I that. I didn't realize. I didn't. You got to get in there. You're in there. You are sighted, sir. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but imagine having a statement from the first 12 apostles, minus Judas plus Matthias, okay, saying, we saw him risen. And we have, imagine we had the first copy of their signatures, the very first copy. We don't have that for any of the gospels. But imagine we had that, and they were all signing, and we're all saying, you see, we saw him. We're all testifying. We saw him. I felt his hands. I felt his feet. I put my hand into his side, and Thomas's signature is right there. We have that for the Book of Mormon with the three and the eight witnesses. We have that. We have the first copy of their signatures on the printer's manuscript. Imagine having the original letters of Paul. We can't even dream of that today. We're a century off of the Gospels and even more than that for Paul. Now, still, historical standards, that's very early. We get close. But what we have for the New Testament are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. But there's 28% of the original manuscript for the Book of Mormon extant today. It exists and can be studied for means and mode of production. And you have scribes giving independent testimonies about how Joseph Smith would uh, use the tools of revelation, read off a portion of the, or, or give the portion that dictate, he's dictating the, the revelation of the, the translated text, and then the scribes writing it down, reading back to him. The errors in the original manuscript that have snuck through are sound errors. They confirm the independent attestation we directly have from the sources that were in the room. And so when it comes to comparing these things, in some way, there's no comparison because we have so much, so many more sources because it's the 1800s. There's so many more sources. We have so many more direct sources and we have lots of interviews. So you can really dive in when we talk about eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses of an empty stone box in New York from which the plates were procured. We have that. We have it from enemies of the church. We have it from non-believers of the church, and we have it from two believers as well. Uh, we have multiple independent accounts verifying, yes, there was an empty stone box in the hill in New York, even from unsympathetic sources. You know, years later, there was a group of missionaries that were coming through New York and wanted to see, you know, the hill. And there's start talking to an old man that was living nearby the hill. And he said, oh, yeah, the Joseph Smith, he got him out of the west side of the hill. It was on that corner. And there was an empty stone box there. And that's since been taken away. But, oh, yeah, that was all there. And it's the exact location Joseph Smith gave 40 years earlier. You know, and those things line up historically. You know, you have enemies testifying to things. The the eyewitnesses, I, I like Dan Vogel's work because when Dan Vogel starts to evaluate, like, were there golden plates? And here's a critical historian, right? So I can respect that, okay? And Dan Vogel, now I'd, I'd make the argument his conclusion's a little ad hoc, okay? But let me just give the basics. Dan Vogel admits there's something. Joseph Smith has something substantial in his possession. Okay. And why is he admitting that? There's so many independent attestations. You know, I'll pull a couple of the random ones out. Emma Hale, soon to be Emma Smith, later after Joseph Smith dies, remarries, you know, Emma, Emma Smith. She's Emma Hale, the son of Isaac Hale. And Joseph boards there during a treasure hunting expedition, meets this cute girl. They desire to start courting, and Isaac utterly refuses. He is not, a, he's early on might have been more accepting, but he decides, no, treasure hunting, this is bad news. I want nothing to do with this, and I want, frankly, nothing to do with you, Joseph. You know, get away from my daughter. Well, they kind of elope. <laughs> okay, so. Then they go back to New York. They're in Harmony, Pennsylvania. That's where that excursion was taking place. That's where Emma grew up. They they elope. They go to New York. And Emma writes her dad for permission to 
you know, get her belongings. Joseph goes, he gets yelled at by his dad. There's tears exchanged. There's hugs exchanged. Joseph says, I'm never going to treasure hunt again. And then just a couple months later, all of a sudden he is claiming to have golden plates in a hill. And Isaac is not impressed. He is not impressed with his son-in-law. He's upset. He's an unsympathetic source. Well, during all the enemies trying to confiscate the plates, they have to flee New York because Early on, everybody believed Joseph had something. They could go to the, the proximity principle, right? They could go to the hill, see the empty stone box for themselves. So you have all these treasure hunters and the early riled up people in Palmyra, they weren't saying Joseph never got anything. They were trying to steal a valuable artifact of these supposed golden plates. Okay, so they actually go to Harmony to do some of the translation. They go back to Pennsylvania. When Joseph goes... Isaac says, you're not allowed in my house until I see these plates, man. You get, you get out of here. And Joseph says, well, you can't see them, but you can hold this box and they're inside. And on its own, Isaac Hale's testimony would just go into obscurity. But when you add the fact, here's an unsympathetic source holding the plates. And say, he's a, yeah, Joseph had something. You have to account for what it was. Okay. And you have just tons of independent attestation from the witnesses given throughout their lives. And so from the eyewitness perspective, it time after time, it, through persecutions and things we can talk about, there's a lot of historical evidence that yes, indeed, it, these would be facts that would be undisputed as a historian using historical principles to review it. Yes, uh, Joseph Smith and others sincerely believed that he had golden plates. Okay, there is an artifact in the possession of him that needs to be somehow accounted for. Um, you have, you clearly have, I don't think any historian would disagree, there clearly was a hole in the hill in New York. I, I think that's very hard to argue historically that there wasn't, uh, that there wasn't a stone box. I, I think you'd be confronted with the historical record if you said that that wasn't there and and then it's about well what do you take these bare basic facts and what do you do with them and we can kind of go from here but i've been talking a long time and i want to pass the ball back Stephen, and well, see where you want to go well um, i think what's interesting is because there's gonna be people that are gonna go and say oh wait a second the witnesses they signed it and and all the three signatures are in the same handwriting i've heard that argument uh, this is the thing folks first of all none of those three witnesses ever uh said that wasn't uh, even if it wasn't their yeah. handwriting they they could have said that they they attested to those testimonies so those of you who want to use that argument fine and then christians i have heard criticism about the book of mormon saying well it's a generic statement written by somebody and these three names are attached to it okay that's fine uh the apostle paul goes and says i have spoken to 500 witnesses to of the resur resurrection of jesus christ that's all he says imagine if in the bible we had 500 names of the people who were witnesses. Guess, the Christian apologists, guess what's going to be their number one argument in favor of the resurrection? It'd be those 500 names, right, Josh? Amen. It sure would. It, it definitely would. I mean, because there you would have an independent attestation of Paul's account, right? Mm -hmm. You would have a verification of that. So historically, that would be supporting not just the event, but also Paul's retelling. That would be a double-edged sword that would be be pretty strong. Now, and, I was talking to a Christian apologist based in yeah. Utah the other day, and he told me the, the witnesses' statements are the strongest argument in favor of the Book of Mormon. He concedes that. Well, and it's because they don't stop. Okay, the witness the witnesses don't stop with one statement that was obviously on the original manuscript. The original signatures would have been there. That document's been damaged. We have 28% today, but unfortunately, their original signatures aren't there, and we have the printer's copy right on the printer's manuscript mm -hmm. but they don't stop from there they spend the rest of their lives being persecuted for this retelling of having seen the golden plates and you know I, I love David Whitmer being pulled out of his house you know guns cocked in front of him lives threatened of him and multiple others and they say give up the Book of Mormon or die basically and in Independence Square, David begins to preach and testify to the Book of Mormon, willing to die for it. So you have 
you know, willing to go bankrupt for Martin Harris, willing to go bankrupt for this thing, you know, after all these events, after they're excommunicated here, I think is something mm -hmm. that never happens in the New Testament, but is so strong for the restoration, not strong for the restoration movement per se, but strong for the actual testimony of what happened for the Book of Mormon production and the coming forth of the golden plates as a real artifact. Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, Martin Harris, the three witnesses are all excommunicated from the church that they founded. The eight witnesses, minus anybody with the last name of Smith, and Hiram Page just leaves. He's not actually excommunicated, but all the others either left and, and were also excommunicated from the church that they helped found. What do you do then? You expose the fraud if you're part of a fraud. I mean, look at look at others from the restoration movement that leave the church. When they do, they bash Joseph. They bash the church. Bennett and others that were part of the first presidency, when they leave, it's vitriol, man. It's hatred. It's anti-everything. Okay. But for the witnesses, they're, they're against some things. They clearly were kicked out. But for them, it's like, man, wolves entered the flock. But let me tell you something. I know the Book of Mormon's true. Thanks. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thanks. Kicked out of the church you founded with a religious movement you were part of the start of. And yet the founding miracle, you can't let go. You won't let go. And to your dying days, and for some of them, even martyrdom, you know, for Joseph and Hiram, even being killed, you know no matter who killed him, <laughs> even being killed, willing to die for their faith and imprisoned Liberty Jail and the testimony of Hiram out of Liberty Jail, and the testimony of Joseph Smith Sr. in prison. And he, Joseph Smith Sr. spoke to his son. He says, my only consolation is the fact that I'm not the first to be imprisoned for the cause of Christ. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, and uh, testifies to the Book of Mormon. So for him, the Book of Mormon was the cause of Christ for Joseph Smith Sr. when he was in prison that, that, that fateful year. You know, I was talking to Jonathan Neville in one of my interviews. I had made the comment how, you know, there is no, uh, you know, they talk about the criticisms of the church. And, and one thing I really liked about your book is that you, you, you talk about the, the, the ugly stuff. You talk about the, the problematic stuff, okay? And I think that's to your credit. I think this is not a hagiography, which I think is, is important. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so this is the thing, though, folks. You know, I was talking, when I was talking to Jonathan Neville, I made the comment. I said, you know, in the first century, there weren't um, other documents called like Christianity unveiled, like there was Mormonism unveiled. <laughs> yeah. And I really feel like if there were other people writing things down, we would probably, they'd probably be writing some things about the apostles that or, or stuff they were doing that we probably wouldn't like because they were human beings just like us. And so there's no Christianity unveiled counter narrative happening in the first century that you have with Mormonism. But I guarantee you, there were probably things that were messy in the first century church. And we actually, in the letters hint to that, we even talk about how there's, there's you talk about there's like rising Gnosticism coming into, they're having a lot of problems with fornication and adultery and all. And it's, it's a big mess, dude. Paul would have probably written less letters and we would have had a smaller New Testament if there weren't problems floating around the New Testament church <laughs> around around the Mediterranean. There were problems and he was writing letters to fix problems. Now, that doesn't excuse the issues from any church. OK, right. that doesn't excuse some of the behaviors that happen. But in my book, I give a fair shake. I, I do not hide uh, treasure seeking. I do not hide adultery accusations. I don't hide mismanagement of funds. Those things are all in the book when it comes into play regarding the coming. I don't hide the Danite Manifesto. I print oh. it verbatim, yep. um, threatening to kill. That's members of the church threatening to kill members of the church. It's in the book. Okay, so I hide none of stuff that makes me cringe. OK, um, it's all there. And because it all bears relevance on whether or not this event is truly a miracle or not, and it all gets weighted appropriately at the end when you start evaluating the facts and you use the historical method of inference to the best explanation to try and infer what is the best explanation for what happened. And my conclusion, obviously, is 
hands down, if you're going to infer that the best explanation of the facts is that Jesus rose from the dead using the same arguments, it's a case closed, open and shut case, slamming down in favor of the Book of Mormon. Thank God I believe in both miracles. So for me, it works well. Uh, it would certainly challenge uh, an atheist, and it certainly would challenge um, somebody that is uh, a priori against the Book of Mormon. But with that, I would just say, if you're open to the evidence and you want to use the historical method I used, I lay it out in the book and I welcome counter explanations to be tested to the same standard because that is a scientific method process that we should use. It, I mean, history is not science, right? But the historical methodology is out there and I welcome people to apply the same standard and come up with counter explanations and we can discuss those together one of my favorite lines in the book is 50 pounds of a gold copper alloy would immediately change someone's life yeah, exactly <laughs> and it's, exactly. it speaks to joseph the treasure seeker joseph being greedy which he readily admits to that he has to go through this uh, process of being attested and then then once he reaches a point of maturity and worthiness to actually receive the plates it's this, it's basically Joseph is admitting that he was a bit of a scoundrel. He was a greedy guy. He was essentially, he was a treasure hunter. He was looking in the earth for copper and gold and things. He like certainly that. was yeah, anybody saying not is just, they're just not looking at, at the data. They're just not looking at the manuscript. Exactly. So, but, but yeah. I think it's, it's, it's another argument, you know, that I think, it, you know, it, this makes it more real. So I, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes that the Utah branch and many of the other branches that they did hagiographies of Joseph Smith, they made him into this like perfect man and he wasn't. And then when people find this stuff out, they lose their faith. Um, they get mad at God. Maybe they just reject God altogether. They reject the Bible. And I think that's kind of a disservice that was done. I think what your book is doing is it's, it's grounded in reality. Um, and it's, 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 it's really trying to give a very strong argument in favor. And this is the thing. You know, see, this channel is not about straw man. It's about steel man and stuff, man. Because if go. Christians think they have the answers and you think you do, then you have to take the Book of Mormon into account if you want to take it seriously. You know, you wrote some quotes where William Lane Craig and a couple others, they just kind of dismiss the Book of Mormon. I'm like, oh, wait a second here. Uh, you would not accept that dismissal of the resurrection that easily. Why in the world would you not use the same tools that you were given to study the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You have this extraordinary claim being made in your own backyard that you grew up in in the United States of another scripture that comes forth, and you don't even have to take the time to at least consider the merits of the argument. Uh, I just find that so, I don't know, I just, come on, guys, you can do better than that. Well, and I, I can't stress enough how highly I view yes. some of these scholars, Absolutely. okay? William Lane Craig is on a pedestal for me that is about as high as it gets from a historical standpoint, from a scholastic stand. I mean, uh, I mean, William Lane Craig for me, he, he's probably my number one. I love him, but they dismiss something without actually looking at the evidence. And so their work for the resurrection should not be discounted because of that. The challenge is my book should be read and it should be engaged with when it comes to the history of the Book of Mormon and the historicity of it and it's coming forth. I think my book does need to be engaged and you have to acknowledge some of the data and do some investigation. I think it would be easy for me to dismiss a miracle that happens in India because it's not from my faith. But from a historian historical standpoint, I can't do that. Okay. I might theologically be challenged. There might be things I need to, you know, look at. But historically, I have a method to evaluate a miracle from history. And I should apply that method, whether it comes from my faith or not. My challenge would be equal to William Lane Craig's if it comes from something non-Christian. Okay. But I should apply the historical method to it and see if it's a testable uh, miracle from history. And I, I would challenge myself with that as much as I would challenge somebody else from a Christian background or an atheist background before they would look at either the resurrection or both miracles. There's a, there's a method here that's being used that I think is worthy of, of review, at least. 
Yeah, and I like William Lane Craig too. I, I actually enjoy um, his stuff. Yeah, uh, so he's good. He's good dude. He's but they, to your point, okay. I they in some of their works, okay. Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona, or no, it was just it's just Gary in one of his writings, and Lee Strobel, I believe. They quote a, a quote from Hugh Hefner, all right, of Playboy mm-hmm. magazine. Yep. And Hugh basically dismisses the resurrection and says, Well, if there was any evidence, it'd be wonderful. And you can kind of hear the dripping sarcasm of, but there's not, you know. And the the challenge from Lee in his work and others was, well, had he really engaged the evidence? Because there is good evidence, and here we're going to present it. And I do the same thing. Um, you know, that it's easy to dismiss something without actually looking at the evidence for yourself. And my book is a, is a way to engage that readily, very easily, very easily with this book for 15 bucks. You can indeed, because I'm quoting a lot of sources, you don't need to go out. And I mean, you don't need to do a lot of digging for, you can take my book and I have enough citations. You can go do the hunt on your own. Okay. But it's all right there in a simple layout for somebody to follow their own trail if they want to. And that's the challenge that's out there, both for me and anybody regarding a miracle from the past. So one of my favorite things about this is that I was finishing up the book this morning before we did the interview. And of course, you then I was like, is he going to have Mary Whitmer in there? Is he going to have her? And you save that to the very end where Mary's story is my last one, my last one. Yeah. And what made you decide to do that? Well, because at the end, I have listened to so many debates over the last three years. My my wife, oh, poor my poor wife. I've listened to so many debates of atheists debating William Lane Craig or Michael Lacona or many, many others. And uh, at the end, William always gives one final argument for the resurrection. And his final argument is always... You can experience God for yourself. He can reveal his truth to you for himself. And see, Mary Whitmer was maybe comparable a little bit to Doubting Thomas. I'm not trying to just draw that parallel perfectly, but a lot of the Book of Mormon gets translated at her house. She has a couple extra people living with her. She already has five boys, some girls. It's already a pretty full house. And in the middle of the translation, when Joseph's eyes are tired or Oliver's hand gets tired as his scribal work, they went out to the back and in the woods and skipped some rocks in the pond instead of milking cows and doing anything that would be remotely helpful helpful to their hosts. And <laughs> Mary was a little discouraged, openly, openly discouraged a little bit. And she, in an early morning, opens the front door and a man meets her who has a, a bundle with a cloth and he lifts it and he shows Mary the plates. And not all of us have the privilege, like the apostles, of being on a boat after a night of not catching any fish and swarms of doubt to meet Christ at the seashore and have confidence and faith installed, okay? Not all of us have Mary Whitmer's experience, but the open challenge of the New Testament, as well as the open challenge of the Book of Mormon, is that God is accessible to us individually, that he can reveal. So the final way to know the truth of a miracle for yourself is experiencing it from God firsthand, the experiential. And that's William Lane Craig's closing argument every time, every debate I watch. It's his closing argument. And it's mine as well. Um, And I list a number of miracles of people that have sincerely sought the Lord on whether or not he inspired the Book of Mormon. And I believe we serve a living God that if he did not inspire the Book of Mormon, he can tell you that as well. But there's a number of experiences in that last chapter, and Mary Whitmer is one of them, that when in doubt, the Lord can and does reveal the truth of his words. He does it for the living Christ. The living Christ is revealed every day to people, and I praise the Lord for that. 
And the same is true for the Book of Mormon, for the sincere seeker of heart. And that's the final challenge of the book. We go through the, the historicity. We go through the historiography. We go through the, the gospel, the hermeneutics of the gospel. And finally, the fourth point is the, the experiential. And all four get coverage within the text of my book. So it's interesting that ultimately William Lane Craig gives his own version of Moroni's promise as his final challenge. Every time, every debate, he does. Yeah. Or at least at least 90%. I so mean, I, the overwhelming number, maybe, maybe we could find one out there, but I listen to him about as frequently as you can. And he always makes that Moroni plea at the end just as if I would for another miracle. Okay. And again, if, if the Book of Mormon is true, it's the strongest evidence ever offered to the world for the resurrection of Jesus. And for me, what a, for me as a believer, what a comforting place that puts me in at the end of my book. Well, Josh, I, I love you very much. And I tell people, I said, the Book of Mormon does not function as scripture for me, but it doesn't bother me that it functions as scripture for you. And I also go so far as to say it is not to me Christian scripture, but is a thoroughly Christian book. And I think that evangelicals, Bible believers, engage the text, read it, study it. Why? Because it's making a claim, a claim that could very much even bolster your own faith and bolster your faith in the Bible, if proven to be true. So those are that's food for thought. Our our love for each other is equal, brother. It's uh it's a philos love. It's a love of brotherhood drawn together by an agape love of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm thankful for our brotherly love for one another and for the love of the God that has called us both in uh, to be workers for him. And and so with that, there's no greater unity that I could have with you than I already do. Amen. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I uh I want to say one of the best things that ever happened to this channel was getting getting exposure for your church, for your group, man. It's one of the proudest things I've done that, that this channel has achieved that I'm most proud of. I uh, I want to ask you about your shirt you're wearing. Uh, what is that logo? <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me uh, do this a little bit, and it may not be easy oh, to see. see. Mm -hmm. There's three letters there, YIA. Mm -hmm. It stands for Youth in Action. And we just finished a wonderful uh 10 days or so, there were multiple youth in action tours going on around the country, but I was with one that was on the Navajo Nation. We did a tent revival week. We had an awesome group of young people who worked their tails off for the Lord and to serve a group of people that have been downtrodden for far too long and uh, have been, uh, the Navajo Nation was severely affected by COVID. At one point, they ranked number one in the nation, but we had an awesome tent revival. Our mission there doubled in size, praise the Lord. And people were met the Lord, encountered the Lord, and were called by Him. And we just had a wonderful time. We uh, shared our pulpit with multiple ministers from the reservation. Uh, they have since reciprocated. We have missionaries right now with them at some of their tent revivals. And uh, we were even honored by President Nez of the Navajo Nation attended with us uh, Friday night and spoke and uh, gave his testimony. And I wish every leader of every organization could have a Christian man like uh, Jonathan Nez uh, leading their people like he does his. Uh, he's a man of faith and a wonderful Christian man. And I, I praise God for, and I'm thankful to him for his support for us. And I think he knows the love and support that we have for him and his people and, and his nation. Um, and so our young people were awesome. And we had a, a great group and, and had a wonderful time. Uh, and you baptized 11 folk, didn't you? We did. Yeah, we did. And, uh, and more are being called. And God's a wonderful. He was present. And the spirit was like a warm blanket. Uh, that week uh, at the meetings. And I hope it's not our last because it was truly, truly a gift uh, overall, start to finish. Well, thanks, Josh, for coming back on the program. Just a reminder, this is the book, Witnessing Miracles, Historical Evidence for the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you're an atheist and you want to be challenged and you're open to evidence, this is a good book. If you're a Christian and you want to be challenged, about your faith, 
and about miracles. This is a good book. And if you're a restoration believer, this is obviously a good book, but I think it can hit all three metrics and you can rate it a one if you want to. But if you do, please challenge the, the contents. If you do. Good point. So. I like that. I like that. Yeah, that's right. Don't just go and do a drive-by uh, writing. Uh, make your case. Yeah. Um, so folks, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I just want to remind you to don't forget to hit the notification button for when a new episode comes out. Um, make sure you do that uh, because uh, it really helps the channel when people get notified. So sign up for that. Also sign up as a subscriber. You know, we're, we're, we're getting very, very close to 2000 subscribers. I actually talked to a producer who has experience in Hollywood, who has uh, volunteered his services to the channel. And he's going to help us create a special 2000 subscriber celebration video. Really excited about that. Uh, making new friends. It's really awesome. Don't forget Patreon and PayPal support links are in the description. Uh, Josh, do you have any final words you want to say before I let you go today? No, just thank you, my friend. And I appreciate uh, your willingness to have me on. And I appreciate anybody that would listen and anybody that would read. I just appreciate each one, believing or unbelieving. It's, it's great to be together. These discussions need to happen. Amen to that. So folks, thanks again for joining us. You all have yourself a great day.